Welcome back to Storytime. I am Stephen Human, and we are reading my newest middle grade novel, The Intergalactic Audacity of Becky Blue Shift. And today we are on episode 17, which is the last episode in book one. So I'm very grateful that you guys have joined me on this little journey. I wanted to give it a try and just see what story time would be like. And I hope you guys have had a fun time. I know I have. Um, so let's find out how the first book ends and what we have to look forward to in the future with episode 17, Grand Theft Loveless. Three guards stood at attention next to the Loveless's entry ramp as a crew of workers unloaded cargo from a produce ship that had just landed. Becky hid behind a crate of sweet-smelling lavender turp fruit from the jungles of New Cameroon. What's the plan? Edison asked as he came up behind her. Can I have one of these terps? Ben questioned while rubbing his stomach. I'm hungry. Would you like me to bring you some recycled food with pepper, small, blonde-haired young man? Unit 204 interrupted. Quiet! Becky hushed. She looked out at the guards with their stun rifles and shock sticks. These were professionally trained soldiers, not inept pirates or cowardly knights in dirty armor. Even with the robot, they would have a tough time fighting their way through. Plus, these guards were just doing their duty. Becky wouldn't be able to forgive herself if one of the sentries got hurt during the escape. Edison reached into the crate and threw a turp fruit to Ben. What if we just walk over there and say we're getting our clothes and school supplies? I bet they'll let us on board. Gratitude filled Becky's chest at Edison's suggestion. Her fatigue had gotten the better of her. Thinking wasn't her best attribute at the moment. That's a great idea, Becky said. Unit 204. Yes, authorized commander. I want you to escort us to the Loveless and tell the guards we're here to get our clothes and school supplies and that you will take us back to Governor Peppercorn after. Tell them the governor ordered you to get our gear. Sound good? 204 nodded in understanding. So you do not wish to tell... So you do not wish for me to tell them we're stealing the ship. Ben stopped chewing his fruit and looked at his sister with a confused look on on his face. Becky paused. Yeah, we don't want you to do that. Don't tell the guards we're stealing the Loveless. Affirmative, the robot said with zeal. I think your little sentiment upgrade threw off his thinking a bit, Edison said. He'll be fine, Becky assured. I'll be fine, the robot chorused. What do we do from there? Edison asked. Not that I doubt your ability to get us both into and out of trouble. I want to know if you have a plan. We get into the ship and we take off, she answered. That's not as detailed as I would like. Becky thought for a second, lips pinched together, as if her mouth helped her think. Remember when your dad said plans were like good jazz music, always evolving and changing with the moment? Yeah, Edison said slowly. She whacked Edison's arm. I'm in the middle of a jazz set. Trust that it's going to sound good in the end. Unit 204, take us out. The robot stood up and motioned toward the ship. Follow me, children. Unit 204 guided the team over to the guards as if leading a school field trip. All three soldiers turned toward them as they approached. Halt, the lead guard said as she stood at the tension. The ship is off limits as per the orders of Governor Peppercorn and the Council of Regents. Yes, Unit 204 began. I have been ordered by Governor Peppercorn to escort these children to the IRV Loveless so they can procure their sleeping clothing and school supplies. Afterward, I will take them for recycled food-like substance with pepper. The guards looked at each other and shrugged. We didn't get any word of you guys coming down, the lead guard said, grabbing for the communication computer on her belt. Let me call it in. Becky nudged Ben quickly in the ribs. Start quying. Start, start quying. Start quying. Everybody start quying. Start crying. Start crying, she whispered. What? Ben asked, a look of annoyance on his face. Start crying about being hungry. The soldier pressed the signal application on her radio device. Yeah, Control, this is... Why won't you let me get my clothes? Ben wailed suddenly with a wink toward Becky. I'm hungry and tired. You guys are so mean. Becky stepped forward and grabbed her brother's shoulders. It's okay, little guy. Eat the rest of your turp. We'll go back to Governor Peppercorn's office and tell him to bring us down here. 
Yeah, Edison added in a fake soothing voice. I'm sure Governor Peppercorn won't be angry at all if he has to come down here himself to help us. I don't know, though. He did seem very sad when we talked to him about his good friends, the Nobels and Blue Shifts, being lost in underspace for eternity. I'm hungry and tired, Ben shrieked. He threw the half-eaten fruit onto the ground with a splatter. I hate terps. I don't want to eat them. The guard stepped back, seeming very uncomfortable with the emotional explosion. I want to sleep in my bed. Hush now, Becky said, trying not to laugh at the over-the-top performance. She turned to the guards. Ah, he's had such a hard time since our parents disappeared. Can we please just run in real fast? The robot will stay with us. We'll be quick and come right back out. We're just kids, after all. What kind of trouble can we get into? A voice squawked on the soldier's communicator. This is control. What was that you said, Sergeant Athelbrath? You need something? The guard pressed her lips together and looked down at Becky, who did her best to make her eyes as wide and innocent as possible, while Ben continued wailing. Nothing control, the sergeant answered. We're good here. Roger that. Ben rubbed his nose and sniffed. Does that mean we can run in? Becky asked with a sugary sweetness to her voice. Yeah, go ahead, the soldier said, nodding her head toward the loveless. Perfect. Oops, sorry. I skipped a page. I mean, there we go. That's better. It would really make not very much sense if we skipped two pages. Thanks so much, Edison grinned as the kids walked past the sentries, followed by Unit 204. We'll just be a second, Becky yelled back as she ran up the ramp toward the ship's interior. Once inside, Becky breathed deeply, appreciating the familiar smell of plastics and processed air. Everything in the main corridor seemed exactly as they'd left it, down to the dirty footprints on the black tiles. Edison smacked Ben across the back. That was a heck of a performance. Thanks. It worked on Dad more than once, Ben admitted, wiping tears from his cheeks. I'm glad you thought of it, Bexter Malone. Your fake cry is enough to make anyone want to get rid of you, Becky said, including fleet soldiers. Are we going to steal the, are we going to steal the ship now? Unit 204 asked with a hint of excitement to his voice. Be quiet, Edison urged. The guards are right outside the ramp. I am sorry, tall, spiky-haired young man. The robot continued. I have never been ordered to commandeer a vessel before, and I must admit, I am feeling a strange sensation in my neural cortex. What's that mean? Ben questioned. Edison started walking toward the command center and adjusted his visor. I think he's trying to say he's excited to be breaking the rules. Excitement! Unit 204 nodded. That is an excellent word! Onward to steal the ship! Footsteps echoed through the halls as the group charged toward the bridge. Becky knew they wouldn't have much time before the guards realized things weren't right. Every second counted. The door telescoped open onto the command center and Edison ran right over to the pilot seat. Through the front window, Becky could see work crews still unloading metal boxes from the supply ship with forklifts and handcarts. Welcome back, Becky Blueshift, Edison Nobel, and Benjamin Blueshift, Ada's voice echoed through the bridge. Hi, Ada, Ben responded with a wave. I detect a foreign android, service class A01, the AI continued. Should I catalog the synthetic entity as a helper bot or a security drone? Security, Becky responded. Our long-range sensors back online. All systems functioning at 65%. Long-range scanners are optional. Operational. Are operational. Perfect. Edison, what are we looking at? I still have the coordinates for the next element in our logs, he said, typing quickly at the computer. The hollow screen activated. Fuel levels flashed in bright greens and oranges in midair. It looks like they fueled up the ship to get it ready to fly wherever they were going to take it. Oh, that's good news, Becky agreed. Yeah, but it's the only good news I have, Edison added. What's the problem? Ben asked. Edison twisted a knob on the chair's armrest and the hologram changed, showing the ACF Trajvason and the th in three dimensions. The force fields on the bay exits won't allow us to pass through. We could try to take off at the same time as the supply ship they're unloading, but who knows how long that's going to take. It could be hours if they have a lot of crates to remove. Oh, ye of little faith, Becky said, patting Unit 204 and his robotic arm. That's why we have this guy. 
What? Is the android going to punch through the force field? Edison snapped. Is this a part of your jazz plan? Hands moving to her hips, Becky stood tall. Unit 204, as a protector of Governor Peppercorn, you have access to the command cortex, correct? Affirmative, authorized commander, the robot replied. Can you give us an access code to allow us to pass through the loading bay force field? Affirmative, 204 said, giving a thumbs up. A skeptical look crossed Edison's face as he stared at Becky through his green visor. Okay... What about the guards? They'll radio control as soon as we close the ramp and start to take off. Unit 204, she began with a smile. Since you have access to the command cortex, you can also shut off communication from specific parts of the ship as well, correct? Affirmative! In triumph, Becky placed her hands in front of her face and pretended to play an invisible trumpet. Jazz! Stupid metaphors, Edison grumbled as he plotted their course. Can I get something to eat? Ben asked. No, they all replied simultaneously, including the robot. Unit 204, Becky said, give Edison the code to breach the force field and cut off communication to control from Hangar Bay 3. As ordered, authorized commander. The android extended its right hand as its fingers split apart and opened with the sound of whirring gears. Cables extended from the tips and plugged into access points on the pilot's chair. Holographic prompts flashed before their eyes until two codes appeared, one reading Bay 03, Access Granted, in green letters, and the other in red, Communication Protocols, Terminated. Is it wrong for me to be following orders that contradict other orders? Unit 204 asked. Do androids usually worry about that sort of stuff? Ben replied. 204 tilted its head to the side as if pondering the question. We do not usually talk to each other about such things. Since you ordered my sentiment upgrade, I do ponder aspects of existence that were previously unimportant. Before today, I have never been engaged in conversation by sentient beings or androids outside of my superiors giving me orders. Well, get ready for Ben to talk your ear off, Becky mumbled. Vibrations cascaded through the ship as Edison activated the engines. Retracting the ramp now and starting liftoff procedures, he said. The ship rocked to the left and began to rise. The guards outside ran to the front window, waving their hands and grabbing their communication devices. They grew smaller and smaller as the Loveless pulled away and turned toward the bay exits. The ship passed through the force field and exited the Trajvason into the frigid vacuum of space. Ha! <laughs> We're out! Edison shouted. No alarms are sounding on the Trajvason. And, not, and I'm not getting any communications for us to stop. The code's worked. All right, Becky said, taking her seat behind Edison. Everybody strap in. We're hitting underspace right now. We just stole a ship, Ben gushed as he buckled his belt. <laughs> this is so cool. Technically, we didn't steal anything, Edison said. This ship belongs to us and our parents. He looked at Becky and nodded. And we're going to save them. Darn right we are, Becky agreed. Ada, prepare for underspace drift. Coordinates accepted, Ada said. Please brace for displacement in three, two, one. With that, Edison activated the antimatter drive and opened an underspace breach. Once again, the universe changed from black space to vibrant colors of swirling texture. Springtime smells filled Becky's nostrils as the hairs on her arms stood at attention. Save, 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 a man's voice called from somewhere in Becky's mind. Save, save. Dad, she whispered. Nitro? Conscious, a woman echoed. Join, join, join. Before Becky could put any of the words together, the ship exited under space with a flash. The Loveless floated quietly, unfamiliar stars filling the window. I heard voices again, Becky said while sitting up straighter in the chair. People were calling me. I didn't hear any voices, Edison said. Are you sure you didn't imagine it? I'm sure it was mom and dad, she replied, looking at Ben. Edison turned his chair and activated his hollow screen. We can figure out if you really heard something later. Right now we need to find out where we are. Ada, I'm, I'm not seeing any planets within five light years from our position. Did we jump to the right coordinates? We are at x-axis 11795, y-axis 949699, z-axis 4563. 
Ada informed. That's right where Blitzer's notes say we should be, Edison said. So where's the planet? Becky asked. Out the window, she could see dozens of dark shapes floating against the stars. We must be in an asteroid field. That has to be where the element is. Ada, Edison continued, are there any asteroids or other potential sources of radiating minerals nearby? There are no charged particles larger than a molecule anywhere within our scanning range, Ada said. Sensors are showing extensive signs of standard metals and traces of isotope fuel. According to gravitational readings, the Loveless is in a section of dead space. Oh, no, Edison breathed. Again, I skipped the pages. I've been reading, what, 17 chapters, and I haven't skipped pages once, and now I've done it twice in the same chapter? I'm sorry to disappoint all of you. Dead space, what does that mean? Becky asked. She had never heard of dead space before. Edison's tone filled her with anxiety. Unit 204 stepped forward. Dead space, noun, a unit of three-dimensional stellar territory where gravity is non-existent. While incredibly rare, non-gravitational spaces have stranded crews aboard numerous craft to await rescue or to perish slowly. Engines cannot fire in dead space and underspace travel is impossible. Ada, turn on the front floodlights, Edison ordered. He stood up and walked to the window as beams of yellow light suddenly illuminated dozens of old space cruisers and damaged vessels. They drifted lifelessly in all directions, spinning and tilting listlessly like trash floating in an ocean. What is this? Becky gasped. Why are the ships all damaged and ripped up like that? Ben asked as he pressed his nose against the glass. Edison's shoulders drooped. Oh, they look like they were scavenged by something or ripped into. What do we do? Ben questioned, looking at his sister. Nothing, Edison said. Sat. Edison sat in his chair and leaned his head back. We can't move under normal power and we can't jump out. Ships have been known to escape areas of dead space using solar wind sails, but that can take months. And I don't think we have the proper gear on board. Well, if something wrecked the ships outside, that means something can move in here, right? Ben hypothesized. That's what I'm worried about, Becky said. Numerous possible scenarios clawed across her brain, all of them screaming the same conclusion. Nitro Nobel's lessons repeated in her ears. If you can't look before you leap, at least know where you're jumping first. Good advice, she thought. Another lesson I'll have to learn the hard way. Turning back toward the windows, she gazed out on the derelict ships. It's a trap, she said finally, and we fell right into it. To be continued. Bum, bum, bum! That is the end of book one. Yes, I ended on a cliffhanger because I mean that way. I hope you have enjoyed story time over the past few weeks. It has been very fun. Um, this is something I wanted to give a try for a really long time, and I thought this would be the perfect book to do it. Um, as always, if you want to get a copy of The Intergalactic Audacity of Becky Blue Shift, feel free to go to stephenhuman.com. You can get the paperback with all of the fun drawings that you've seen during a story time. Um, you'll be able to read it to your kids and have fun. Book two will come out. I have not even begun it yet. Sorry. Um, I'm currently working on Dream Forgers, which is my next adult uh, sci-fi thriller series. Um, but as soon as that first book is done, I will begin book two of this. And hopefully it won't take me very much time. Of course, if this is really popular and people are totally digging it, then I'll stop Dream Forgers and I'll do the next one. Because this was really fun to do. It was super fun doing the artwork and doing the story. Um, and I wanted to have something that my kids would enjoy. And so now they do. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys had a great time. Thank you so much for joining me. And I will see you next time, sometime in the not too distant future for story time.